We return tonight into the Sermon on the Mount. And for the first time in the many weeks we've been walking through the fifth chapter, we leave the fifth chapter and head into the sixth chapter for a little bit. We are not done. We are not finished with the fifth chapter. We'll be back. There's a little more we want to do in the Beatitudes. There's a little bit here and there in that chapter that we brushed as we were working our way through. But um, over the last week, as I was thinking about, praying about, and concentrating on what to do in the Sermon on the Mount, the only thing, and I mean the only thing that jumped out at me has been this part in the early part of the sixth chapter that deals with the Lord's Prayer. And that doesn't indicate that there's nothing else worth talking about. It's just I really do believe if we'll follow the dictates of the Spirit, we'll land where we're supposed to land, and not just in our own Tuesday night study, but in your life in the way you study the Bible, and in your day-to-day -day existence. Just listen for the gentle tones of the Spirit. We're, I think sometimes we're guilty, all of us, of looking for big, bombastic explosions and then going, okay, that was God trying to get my attention. And while God can certainly get your attention through whatever He wants to do, I think it's better served for us to learn to follow the Spirit in the gentle moments, just to hear His peace and go in accordance to that. I'm trying to do that on this journey. Really, whatever stands out at me during the week is where I try to steer my vessel a little bit. And so I want to talk about uh, my subtitle tonight is, well, actually our title. We haven't titled this series anything. So our title tonight is Say Your Prayers, um, a statement that we all heard when we were kids in school or in, or in Sunday school or our parents might say, say your prayers before you go to sleep or say your prayers um, over your meal or whatever. And we knew what they meant because from the earliest days, our parents would teach us little prayers, something like, now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep. They were repetitious prayers. They were little statements that helped focus us in a certain direction. Somewhere along the way, in many of our Protestant circles, particularly in our evangelical circles, a lot of us abandoned repetitious prayers. I think we abandoned them because in some ways they were a little too Catholic. You know, they, they had too much structure. And how can you follow the Spirit if you're so structured? At least that was, uh, that was how I came up. Um, and then I think another way that we abandon them is a verse that we'll cover tonight where Jesus talks about repetitious, vain repetitions, where you say the same thing over and over and over again. And I think we sort of took that statement from the Sermon on the Mount. It's interesting to me how we take some things in the Sermon on the Mount super serious and then other things don't take serious at all. One of the things we took super serious in the Sermon on the Mount was Jesus saying, watch out for vain repetitions. So we wouldn't ever repeat anything in prayer for fear that, you know, we would be praying something inauthentic. Well, as I'm entering my mid-40s, I'm uh, trying to continue to grow. Um, it's not easy because we get locked into things and we don't want to leave them. Growth requires us to shed skin. Sometimes I wonder if when Jesus said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, we always take that to mean that the serpent knows how to say what needs to be said in the, in the moment. Maybe it's because snakes know how to shed their skin and move on. And one of the things wisdom would bring us is to know what to leave behind. So in, my, in this decade of my life, I'm trying to figure out what to leave behind and what to hold on to. And I'm finding that uh, some of the things that are coming back to me are things like say your prayers. Going back to those, a little bit of that structure, a little bit of those things that I would have said, something like, the Lord's Prayer, um, that for a long time, and I say this up front tonight because I think I've got viewers and listeners who are really going to identify with this next 30 seconds, and that is this, that for a long time I shied away from things like the Lord's Prayer because I had been convinced that Jesus was speaking in an old covenant world, and therefore the things that He said in the Lord's Prayer don't necessarily apply to me under the new covenant. Well. I would say that if Jesus says it, it's probably a pretty good idea to pay attention to it and to at least appreciate the fact that the Lord Jesus said it. So over tonight and into next week, we're going to deal with the Lord's Prayer. And I can't promise it won't take me three weeks or four weeks because although it's a really short prayer, it sure does pack a punch. It says a lot. The lead-in 
deals with things uh, like the ninth verse of Matthew 6. Um, let me show you a comparison. And this, these, this, this couple of verses actually helps get us on the right foot tonight. It's, this is in the middle of it. It's not the top of the text, but sort of right in the middle where Matthew 6, 9, in this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I want, that's Sermon on the Mount. But that's not the only time Jesus talks Lord's Prayer. So let me go to the other one because I want to show you a context that doesn't appear in the Sermon on the Mount from Luke 11. Top of the chapter, it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. There's a couple things you'll notice in this passage. Is one, they watched and listened to Jesus pray. And when he stopped, they were so impressed they asked if he could teach them how to do that. So there was something about Jesus' prayer life that was visually attractive or that was physically appealing in that they could actually see him pray. It wasn't just this stoic moment, quiet, maybe eyes closed or mumbling into the distance, but there was something about his prayer that looked different than their prayer. And they were raised praying the Hebrew prayers, but there was something in which Jesus was something he was doing that was unique, that was different. It's tough for us because we're not in an in a audible repetition environment. They were in Judaism. So you have things like praying the Shema and praying out loud the same words together in a group, and yet they're impressed with Jesus, which tells me he wasn't doing what they had grown up doing. He wasn't doing what they had always been accustomed to seeing in prayer. He was giving something else. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that they felt that they could be taught. Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Whatever he's doing, we wanted to learn how to do it. It didn't look supernatural. They didn't, no one ever said to Jesus, teach us how to walk on water. Because it's walking on water. You, you don't expect that that miraculous can be repeated. Even Peter sinks when he tries. He goes, well, there's something beyond us in this walking on water bit. But they do say, teach us to pray. Because they see that it could be done the way he's doing it, if we could just figure out how he's doing it. And so they also knew that prayer, prayer school was typical because John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. John teaches them to pray, hey, Jesus, what if you taught us how to pray? And I, I use that to lead into uh, the next thought, verse 2. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven. That's the same verse from the Sermon on the Mount. I wanted to show you how those cross over. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, the disciples don't say, teach us to pray. This is another reason why we can assume that the Sermon on the Mount is a conglomeration. It's a puzzle in which you take a moment from this moment in Jesus' life, and you take a moment from this moment, and you put them together in one big sermon that takes Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's not necessarily, not necessarily is Jesus preaching one big, long sermon in the Sermon on the Mount, but it's been compiled as one sermon by the author, Matthew. Luke gives us insight into that there was at least a conversation that took place in front of that, in front of that message. Um, that gets us started with, with the idea that prayer is something we can do by paying attention to how Jesus does it. Therefore, to me, it seems backward to say to people, the Lord's prayer is not that important to you. They watched Jesus pray. They asked him to teach them how to do it. And then he said, it would sound like this. So even though I don't feel like my obligation every day is to recite the Lord's Prayer front and backwards, to understand what it means is pretty important. Um, so let me interject my own little mini prayer school on you. Um, this is not a prayer lesson, as much as it seems like we're starting one. It's really not. And the reason it's not a prayer lesson is because I don't... I don't teach prayer well because I don't feel like I do it well. Now that might seem odd to you because you probably assume that anyone that teaches or preaches the word probably has a high quality prayer life. And I don't know, maybe I do. I don't feel like I do. That's the difference. Um, and the reason for that is not because I don't pray, but because for me, it is the only thing that I really do is twofold. One, I take very serious Paul's injunction to pray without ceasing. 
Because of that, I don't have designated prayer blocks in my life, prayer times. Pray at 6 a.m., pray at 8 a.m., pray at 2 p.m. Don't have those. That's always made me feel a little inferior to people that do. Just sort of bearing my own soul for you here. Because there was always the guy that'd be a 5 a.m. prayer warrior. And I tried all of that. You know, prayer journals and alarm clocks and stopwatches and the whole nine yards. Um, so I, because I don't have that, and I take Paul's injunction to, to the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing series, meaning that I really think that I'm supposed to be, maintain some form of constant communication with the Father, that I don't ever really have to shut it down, that there's not got to be this moment where I go, okay, prayer's over with, talk to the Lord again in three hours. But rather, I've, I try to keep that conversation open and alive, which causes me to even talk to myself a lot. Um, hidden cameras would show me talking to myself frequently, day and night. And it's, I've conflated talking to myself with talking to God. I've done that for most of my life, particularly most of my adult life, because I don't feel that there's a distance. Um, the other thing is I pray as someone who believes he belongs in the room, but not as someone who believes he can tell God what he's supposed to do. And because of that, I've always felt inferior around people that teach prayer because people that teach prayer teach you the things you're supposed to say and declare and the scriptures you're supposed to quote and what you're supposed to call down from heaven and bind on the earth. And I don't pray that way. I don't presume to tell God who he's supposed to heal, how he's supposed to act, who he's supposed to chase, convict, bless, or favor. I pray his will and I ask that he make me pliable to form me to look like he would have me to look. And when I pray for people in their sicknesses or their disease or their problems, I ask the Lord to heal, but I don't call down healing as some command, as if there's some obligation from heaven to do what I think should be done in that moment. I'm learning to pray, Father, what, whatever happens in this, change us. Because I'm finding that I need changed. I need changed up here and I need changed in here. And I probably need changed out here. And so, Father, whatever happens in this, I got to learn something. Whatever happens in this, I need to come out of this not just healed. I need to come out of this better, smarter, wiser, stronger. What good would it do me to be healed and be no wiser? and be no stronger, and be no smarter. And so there's gotta be more in this than just getting the thing I think I need. And so that's why I say to you, I don't teach prayer well because I don't walk into it with these forms and formulas and structures and tell you how to go do it. But I do try to take some cues from the Lord Jesus where I can. I try to take some cues from how I see them pray in the Word. And I'm trying in this hour to learn that when I don't know how to pray, at least say my prayers. So let's start there. When you don't know what to pray, say your prayers. It helps to have a template, if not word for word, at least an idea of what prayer includes. And that to me is the, sermon, the, the, the Lord's Prayer from the Sermon on the Mount. It's also scripture so that you have scripture as the basis for what to pray or how to pray. So when I don't know what to pray, I say my prayers and they look like the 23rd Psalm and they look like Matthew 6 and they look like the Apostle Paul. And that's why reading my Bible is vital. It's not just essential to read your Bible to teach or to preach or to evangelize. What happens when you don't do any of those things? Reading my Bible is not just to memorize scripture for the sake of memorizing scripture, but so that I'll know what to pray when I don't know what to pray. So that when I go to the Lord, I don't know what to say to you right now, but I have this verse in my heart. So I'm going to pray this verse and I'm going to pray this Psalm or I'm going to pray this proverb and I'm going to believe on the Jesus who died for me that this is real in my life. And so when I don't know what to pray, then I say my prayers and I use the template for whatever that template is. Here's some thoughts, and this is how we're going to get into this tonight, through the gateway of the Old Testament into the New. And that is, you are going to meditate. 
You may not think you are, but you are. Because the reality is, is your mind is toiling over something. I promise. Consciously, subconsciously, on purpose, not on purpose, your mind focuses on something. Sometimes it's your... I, I just put some stuff up there. You could enter a thousand things that you know your own mind is dealing with. Your body, your health, your money, your cravings. Your focus is going to include stuff you don't like too. Stuff like your fears or your jealousies or your hurts. Your dreams, your fantasies. Whatever crosses this threshold, your mind's going to do something with it. Now we can all be super zealously spiritual and go, well, I always kick out the bad and include the good. But you're lying because you don't do that because none of us do that. We don't always kick out the bad and only think of the good. <laughs> so don't, don't kid yourself. And if that's the case, if, if it were so easy that we automatically did it, then the Bible wouldn't even bother to tell you to, how to control your mind. It wouldn't even bother to tell you that you needed to because you'd just do it automatically. Now that you're born again, boom, no bad thoughts enter your mind. You don't ever stress or toil over anything. We know that's not true. So you are actually going to meditate on something and your mind is actually going to toil on something. Both Old and New Testaments are concerned with this and thus they both give us some ideas on how to focus that meditation. Let me start with the first time the word appears in the Bible. It's actually a pretty unimpressive moment. Genesis 24. Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening and he lifted his eyes and looked and there the camels were coming. He's actually standing in the field waiting on his new bride, Rebecca, and over the horizon comes the caravan that's bringing Rebecca to meet him. Abraham did not want Isaac to marry a daughter of the Canaanites. He wanted him to marry someone from their own family, their own country, their own bloodline. And so he sends his servant, Eleazar, back and he brings back Rebecca. And Isaac goes and stands out in the field and waits for the caravan to come over the horizon. And the first time the Bible ever uses the word meditates right here. Here's what's interesting. It never uses this word again. In the Bible. Though the word meditate is going to pop up, we're, we're about to use it twice in two of the most popular moments of the Old Testament. But the Hebrew word that's used right here for meditate doesn't pop up again. Because meditate right here is just to sort of mull stuff over. It doesn't really have a focus. It's just a mind that's it's meditating, it's thinking, it's, it's nothing specific, just sort of out there. This is quiet time. Isaac just walks out into the field for a little alone time. Now notice, he doesn't really have anything to meditate upon. We don't have Torah yet. We don't have the law. He does have what God told his dad. He does have what he knows is coming over the horizon, his bride-to-be. So I'm sure he's meditating on those things. Kick out the idea that meditation is you sitting with your, you know, crisscross applesauce and your hands folded and you're humming and you got incense playing in the background. That's kind of how I was taught meditation. That's what meditation was. It was a Buddhist thing. Christians don't meditate. And then when you start to read your Bible and you find out that, well, Jews did. And then when you get into the New Testament, well, lo and behold, so did the early church. You go, okay, well, maybe someone's messed up my idea of meditation. Well, that's way more likely. And so Isaac meditates, but he doesn't have much to meditate on. And then the text rounds out because Torah comes along. God gives the law by which Israel structures herself. And then this is one of the most famous meditation verses in the entire Bible, Joshua 1.8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. And the word that is used here for meditate is the word that is used nearly a hundred times, I think, in the Old Testament for meditate. And it is really, really, really close to the word mutter. I mean, you are taking the words of the law and whispering them aloud in a fashion that is not to your neighbor, but is to you. This is really close to talking to yourself. And so God tells Joshua, take what you've read and recite it over and over again. It would sound something like this. Say your prayers. Your prayers are the things that are written down. And so say them. Now, we are New Covenant people. So what happens when we look at verses like this is we start to delineate between Old Covenant and New Covenant. And sometimes what we'll do is we'll take, say, a Joshua 1.8. We'll go, well, you and I don't live off the law. And so therefore, we don't have to meditate on the law. That's not how our way is made prosperous. Listen, 
Our way is made prosperous by Christ. We are not made righteous by repeating the law, but the principle for God's people to meditate on the, thing, on the foundation of their covenant seems to be what God's trying to say to Joshua. And so if the foundation of their covenant was what they meditated upon, that's how they made their way prosperous. That's how they saw success. And so part of what we're doing in prayer and meditation is in muttering or speaking the things that make our covenant what it is. Here's the other probably most famous moment from the first song of the Jewish songbook, Psalms 1. Verse 1, this is how that whole book begins. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. It's the same Hebrew word that God used with Joshua, that there's a constant muttering going over, going on among the guy who doesn't walk in the un, with the ungodly or stand in the way of the system of this world, he delights in God and he mutters this day and night. And this is what happens to that man. Verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. And so there's shades of the Garden of Eden and the tree of life. And there's a shadow of that tree of life in the book of Revelation that stands next to the river of God. There's also the sound of the river that Jesus says in John 17, if a man comes to me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So we've got the, the river leaving the garden and ending up in the revelation in another garden. And in between, we're muttering, meditating on what God says about us and what God says to us. And as I mutter and meditate on what God says about me and to me, I plant myself right next to the same river that flows from Genesis to Revelation that flows right through Jesus. Now we can see that because we're on the other side of the cross and we're looking back. I'm not trying to say to you that anyone that sang the first psalm was thinking Jesus. They couldn't have thought that. But they did think tree. They did think living tree. They did think river. And where was that in their story? Genesis. And so out of the creation account comes this river that flows. And how do we plant ourselves beside it? Through meditation. Now let's deal with those terms for a moment because some of us get lost in the terms. I know I do. Don't make a hard distinction between meditation and prayer. It's very easy, and I think we've even been taught this, and I think to our peril. I'll try to explain why. But it's easy to see one is inward, selfish, meditation, and the other is upward, godly, prayer. That meditation's focusing too much on me, while prayer gets to focus on God. I don't think that distinction is right, because that puts God at a distance. That means that when you meditate, you're only thinking of you. And if you're thinking of you, then you can't possibly be focused on God. And if that's the case, then the New Testament should never tell you to self-examine. Because if self-examination pulls you away from God, then why would you ever self-examine? Paul told the church at Corinth to self-examine, to make sure they're still in the faith. Because also, if there is a distinction in which one is selfish and the other is godly, then that would put God at a distance because God's not in you. So if God's not in you, then meditation would be focusing inward where there is no God and prayer would be focusing upward where there is a God. And we're better than that. We know Christ is in us the hope of glory. And so if we look inside, what are we going to find? We're going to find us, but we're going to find him. He's there with us as well. And so muttering or mumbling on or dwelling on what he says about us doesn't pull us away from who he is, but to more towards where he is. In fact, there's not even an adequate definition in the Hebrew for the word prayer. But every definition includes reflection and self-examination. So when the Hebrews used the phrase prayer, they were not thinking up and out. They were thinking in and up. That prayer demanded an, a look inward so that you could look upward. It's also why traditionally we bow our heads. It's not just to take our eyes off of what's going around us. It was a type of looking in so that your prayer could go up. Because how could you talk to God if you weren't looking inward at who you are. And so 
I think this has to be what they bring to the table when they say to Jesus, teach us to pray. This is what they understand of prayer. And what they're seeing of Jesus is this amazing ability to take this to another level, a place they haven't seen before. So let's do that with him. Here's how he lays it out in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, 5, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. So Jesus starts his prayer class by telling you what not to do, which seems like a pretty good place to start if you're guilty of doing the wrong thing all the time. And the example of prayer to the disciples was Jesus in private and the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and high priests in public. To a Jew in the first century and living and dwelling around Jerusalem, the most holy people on the planet would have been Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, high priests. So how they pray must be how you're supposed to pray. So Jesus goes after that first. He goes, okay, let me tell you what not to do. The thing you see them doing all of the time. Just standing on the street praying real loud so everyone knows they pray. This is the guy that has to tell everybody his prayer calendar. He has to make sure people know how much he prays, when he prays, how long he prays, what verses he prays, what translation he uses when he prays, and he's always telling you the stuff God told him while he prayed. Let me ask you, has, have you ever been talking to the Lord and he spoke something to your heart and you weren't supposed to tell anyone? See, I see a few heads nodding. Good. I dare say you're starting to discover what it means to pray. Because prayer is an intimate conversation. It doesn't mean that you don't ever tell it. It means it's not the first place you go with it. If I have an intimate conversation with my wife, it doesn't mean that what happens in that conversation never gets repeated. It might mean that. It doesn't necessarily mean that. But it also means that because it's an intimate conversation, it might never get announced to anyone else. That's the nature of relational conversations. They're not talking about the weather in a doctor's office with a total stranger. There's something better. There's something deeper. And so no announcement needed. The reason I gave you that little quiz, have you ever felt the Lord told you something you weren't supposed to tell anyone else? Don't feel bad if you haven't, but rejoice if you've ever been there because I think you're starting to understand what prayer is. It's being able to hear the voice of the Spirit that doesn't have to be announced. It doesn't have to announce itself. And so the first thing Jesus says is let's dispense with this idea that everybody's got to know about it. Everybody's got to know what you're doing. Everybody's got to know what you're up to. He said the hypocrites have fallen into that, have fallen into that pattern. Um, they have the reward. Six. But you, now contrast, here's what I want you to do. When you pray, go into your room and when you shut your door, Pray to your father who's in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. How many of you came up with teachings on prayer closets? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, okay. Prayer closet was a statement that meant have a designated private place where you go and pray and you close yourself in. Maybe it's a bedroom. Maybe it's literally a closet. Maybe it's the cab of your truck. Maybe it's a stump in the back 40. Whatever it is, the, the, the prayer closet is the place where you isolate yourself. Um, I'm not mocking that. I'm not cutting it down. But I think it's taking hyper-literal something that Jesus is trying to say in contrast to what he told you not to do. What did he tell you not to do? Make prayer an announcement by which you get your praise from people who know you're praying. He said, instead, if you want to do this right, now remember, in Luke, they've asked Jesus, teach us to pray. So this stuff, even though we don't see them ask him, teach us to pray, we got to assume this is the stuff that he teaches them. And one of the things he says is, dispense of this need for others to know what you're doing. Prayer is not about the announcement or the pronouncement or even you announcing what God said to you. But instead, treat it like you would anything that happens behind closed doors. It's private first. If it happens behind closed doors, it's private first. It doesn't mean it's always private. Not everything that happens behind, behind closed doors is private. But it starts private. And that's what Jesus says. Prayer starts private and it starts personal. It only moves outside of that door after it's adequately been behind that door. In other words... 
I think there's a public prayer and a private prayer. Jesus compares those two. So I'm going to ask a couple questions. I'm going to try to answer them with the word. Is public or corporate prayer wrong? Because Jesus says, don't be like these guys that's got to stand on a corner and pray out loud so everybody knows they can pray. So that demands the question, is corporate prayer wrong? And what advantage is found in private prayer? The second question doesn't answer the first question. I did that on purpose. The first question is, should we pray corporately? The second question is, what advantage would be found in doing what Jesus said do? which is close yourself off and pray. Let's, let's deal with the corporate aspect first. And what I mean by corporate, public prayer. We're going to have one right at the end of this message. I do that every week. We'll get to the end of the word. I pray corporate prayer. Most of the time, I don't know if you bow your heads or not. My eyes are closed. You, maybe you bow your heads. Maybe you pray. Maybe you don't. But whatever it is, it's a moment where the whole room's doing the same thing generally. Corporate prayer. In a lot of circles, we'll have someone lead that. Say, hey, Brother so-and-so, sister so do you want to lead prayer over the offering or whatever? That's a version of corporate prayer. Is it biblical? Because if all you had was Jesus' statement, you don't pray on the corner so everybody can see it, maybe the answer would be no. So let's go to Acts 1. This is the birthing of the early church. Acts 1.12, they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olives. Jesus just ascended, by the way. This is the very moment after the ascension at the Mount of Olives. Which is near Jerusalem. It's a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. And then we get a little roll call. We ought to recognize these names. These are the disciples. Peter, James, John, Philip, Andrew, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, Simon, Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Family, both genders, Jesus' inner circle, prayed in one accord, public prayer. Now it's private, but it's corporate. They're not standing on the street corner, but they are together, all praying, and this is the key, with one accord. So their mindset is focused on praying the same thing. You might say, what are they possibly praying? I would say they've got to be praying the one thing they were told to pray. In Acts 1, Jesus said, go tarry in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. And when you are endued with that power, you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. That's all they got. And so the one accord is, we're here for the promise. And I got to think that as they opened the scripture, they started reading the promises, trying to figure out which one it was, because there's a bunch of them in the Old Testament. Now, they were smart enough to know they have their Jewish calendar, so they know they're approaching a Jewish holiday, Pentecost. 50 days after Passover. So most likely they're opening their Torah and reading the stories of Pentecost's gone in days gone past and saying there's a promise that's coming our way in the midst of this. What would that look like? As they are in one accord, we get to Acts 2. And in Acts 2, the day of Pentecost has fully come. They were all in one mind. They were all in one accord. Came a sound like a mush, rushing mighty wind. You know the story, right? How'd that happen? Corporate prayer. So what's, what do we do in corporate prayer? We get in one accord. So our, our little corporate prayer at the end is over what we just taught. Hopefully. I mean, you can pray about anything you want, but most of the time your focus is going to be somewhat on what you just heard, I think. At least that's what we do in corporate prayer. That's also why, like when we had our last monthly meeting and we had a little circle prayer and we prayed specifically for an individual whose name we called out and called out what we wanted to pray together. Why did we do that? So that we would be in one accord. So that we could fill up, I mean, I got a sermon that's gonna post this weekend, filling up what lacks in Christ's affliction, which is a, that was a heady one. I'd never preached that in my life, but Paul said it in Colossians. He said, I fill up in my body what lacks in Christ's affliction. And boy, I went to the mat with that and went, what possibly lacks? In Christ's afflictions. I'm not going to stand here and preach that for you. You can watch it Sunday with everybody else. But the point is that there was something that Paul believed brought fullness to what Christ did. I think that happens when we're in one accord. We bring a fullness. In some ways, I fill up what you lack and you fill up what I lack. And that's one big reason why we bring our petitions together and go, hey, do you have anyone you'd like for us to pray with you about or anything you'd like for us to pray with you about? Because corporate prayer makes a difference. 
So then that's the answer to the second question. What's the advantage of going into the private place then? Corporate prayer sounds awesome. That's because it is. Because if I've got you and 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 you praying about something that's important to me, then when I'm not praying, somebody probably is. Someone's making my petition known in front of the Father. You might be bringing, to, you might be bringing clarity to the things I lack. Beautiful. But in the private place, something special happens because Jesus said, when you pray, get into your secret place, close the door, shut yourself off from the rest of the world. And that causes me to say why. And here's what I think. We do not wrestle with big things in the public square. We tackle these big things in private, in the secret place where we have developed a relationship. You do not go to the mat with big stuff in public. You go in private. This is why we stop, and for those watching that don't know this, here's you a little hint. This is why we stop recording when we say amen on these videos, so that we can wrestle out together things that are too big for the public square. Some of them are things I don't want to say on camera because I don't have them worked out, or I want to take you down a road I don't want to take other people down, and I want us to wrestle it out together, and I trust the room, and I know that we can... We don't have to fall on an answer. You won't freak out and, and give up and go, oh, I can't believe he, they said that. Or you will, and then you, maybe you need to. I guess that's your sign. This was time to leave. But the point is, is that we, we limit that damage because we bring it out to people we're in relationship with, not to strangers. You could say it this way. You don't talk about adult subjects with kids at the table. Is it because adult subjects shouldn't be talked about? No, not unless you're prudish. Adult subjects can be talked about with adults, but you don't talk about them when there's little kids at the table. And it's not, you're not talking about them, go, well, they're gonna have to learn sometime. No, we have limits. We go, we don't, well, of course they're gonna learn sometime. They're not gonna learn tonight. <laughs> not with me at the table, not with you at the table. They can learn that at another time. And so that happens in the, in the private place, in the quiet place, in the closed doors, away from the public square, away from the street corner, away from screaming it out in front of everyone else because special things happen when you're in that moment where you're free in relationship because then you can really speak your, your mind. You can tell the truth and the truth isn't pretty. Because the truth is you telling God what you think. And if you'll get serious about this and actually close your prayer closet door, and I don't mean actually, but I mean allegorically close your prayer closet door, then you'll tell God what you think. And that's okay. And it'll be loud and harsh and tough and rough, and you'll say some things you didn't think you could say to God. And he's okay with it because he's God. He's a big boy. He can handle it. You can bring big adult stuff to the table with an adult God. And he can handle it. And that's why you close your door. So what's the advantage of the private place of prayer? If you haven't been taking advantage of that, then I don't know if you've discovered the beauty of prayer. It's taking stuff to God and going, this isn't too big for you. And I, I, I need an answer. I, don't, I know you don't have to give me the answer today. I know you don't have to give me the answer tomorrow. Heck, I know you don't have to give me the answer at all. But I'm still going to bring it to you. And I'm still going to wrestle it over with you. And we're still going to fight about it and work on it. So we tackle them in private in the secret place. Pray, Jesus said this, pray to your father who is in secret. And I think that speaks to the relationship that puts you in the room. Hear that. Pray to your father, which is in secret. Why is your father in secret? Is he ashamed to be your father? No, it's because you know him as father when you go meet him in the secret place. That's when you realize we're in relationship. You see, you meet relation in the secret place. Secret place doesn't have to be intimate. Secret place is where your family meets behind the front door, in the dining room. That's your family's place. That's not the stranger's place. That's not your next door neighbor's place. That's your family's place. Your kids feel comfortable sitting at the table because they're in the secret place. They're at home. And so when Jesus said, pray to your father who's in secret, he's speaking to a relational kind of prayer, realizing you're talking to the father. I liken it to the story of the father in Luke 11, who is in bed and his children are in bed. And you'll remember this. Remember when we started tonight, I told you Luke 11 is the moment where the disciples say, teach us to pray. And Jesus prays the Lord's prayer. You know what comes next? 
That little story where Jesus says, it's like a man who is in bed with his children and a friend knocks on his door at midnight. And in that famous story, Jesus says, the friend that knocks at midnight has had a visitor, but he doesn't have any bread to give him. So he's knocking on your door asking for bread. And inside, the father says, no, I'm in bed with my children. And as the man keeps knocking and keeps knocking, he finally gets up and gives him everything he's asking for. Jesus turns right around and says, how many of you, if you have a son and he asked you for bread, how many of you would give him a stone? How many of you, if you had a son and he asked you for a fish, would give him a scorpion? He, he names all these weird, no one would give their, who would give their kid a scorpion anyway? That's the point Jesus is making. You got to give, give your kid a scorpion. You don't like your kid very much. <laughs> Jesus' point is you love your kid. you intimate. You have relationship with your kid. And therefore, if they ask, you'll give them what, they're, what they want. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. And so what we've done is we've created a culture where people think they got to keep knocking. Knock, 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 knock. If you'll knock, God will answer. If you'll knock... Get persistent. Get consistent. Beg God. Now listen, I want to make sure I say this properly. I am not against you asking twice. I, I've, heard, I've seen people make such a big deal of this. They're like You don't have to ask twice. If you'll ask once and believe. Asking twice means you don't believe. No, sometimes you ask twice because you really want it. I mean, I understand. And sometimes you ask twice because you, you, you articulate it. You think you articulate it better the second time. I, I don't mock you for asking twice. It's the mentality behind why we ask. And so when Jesus says, you get up and give them bread because they, he uses the phrase, because of their importunity, because they're persistent. The truth is, is if you knew you were the child next to the father, you could just ask for whatever you want. You can ask for the bread and the dad won't give you a stone. But if you don't know you're in relationship, then you think you're outside the door. And if you think you're outside the door, the best you've got is just keep knocking. Just keep knocking. I'm going to here to tell you, you're better than just keep knocking. You're in room with your father. And being in the room with the father is the key. So when Jesus says, pray to your father who is in secret, what he means is pray to the father that's inside the room. And when you're in there, you can wrestle out big things, important things. We can be the outsider knocking or we can be the insider in a relationship because in relationship you can deal with the deeper things. All right, let me give you a couple more verses and we're going to try to land this. Matthew 5, 7 and 8. When, the, when, you do, when you pray, this is the next two verses in sequence. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. That sentence right there has caused some of us to move away from anything that sounds like yesterday's prayer. So I prayed this. Can't say that word for word again because that would be repetition. But notice, it's not, vain re it's not just repetition. It's vain repetition as the heathen do. You're not the heathen. You're the son. You're in relationship with the father. This isn't about saying the same thing twice or saying the same thing three. It's about saying the same thing in vain because you feel like an outsider. That's a Gentile. Because you've been taught that if you say it enough, It'll break through. Therefore, don't be like that. <laughs> they think they're going to be heard if they say it a bunch. Don't be like that. Your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. If your father knows what you need before you ask him, why ask? Right? I know that's how we've all, that's what I've, I've been there too. Go, he knows what you need before you ask. You don't even have to ask. Then what's the point? I mean, why even do a lesson? Why, did Je why didn't Jesus, when they said, teach us to pray, just go pray? You guys don't need to pray. Father already knows what you need before. You no, put this in context. In context, it's this. Listen, stop just saying a bunch of words, thinking that if you say a bunch of words, it's going to get you through to God. Know that you're one of his kids. You're not an outsider. You're inside the room. You're not outside the door. Don't act like that. Dad knows what you need, so get alone with dad and talk to him. Now that's a way, that makes a lot more sense than, hey, don't even bother to pray. I mean, God knows what you want anyway. Because if you go down that road, and I've had, 
We've been there. We've all been there. But I've had questions. I've had legit Q&As in churches and people raise their hand and go, hey, the Bible says God knows what I need before I pray. Can you tell me what's the value of even praying? And I think, man, we have really gotten off the rails. If our landing spot is I need to be talked into praying. No. I don't need to be talked into. I don't want my, I don't hope my kids don't need to be talked into talking to me. It's like, well, dad's going to do it all anyway. I don't need to converse with dad. What kind of relationship is that? We would call that spoiled, right? They're so spoiled, they don't even talk to you. They know you're going to pay the bills and put food on the table and keep their car running. They don't have to talk to you. They don't say hi or bye or nothing. You know? What kind of relationship is that? Well, imagine prayers a little bit that way as we talk to the Father. It's not magic. Where if you do it correctly... You unlock this deep secret. Let's stop it. Like if I was this prayer warrior, I'd be unlocking all this. I just don't know how to pray right. That's why God didn't heal that person. I didn't know how to quote the right verse. That's why God didn't move in that way. That's not, this is not magic. Approach the Father as if He knows your deepest secrets and He still wants to talk to you anyway. I, was actually, I actually liked that sentence when I came up with that two days ago. What if you approached God as if He knew all your problems and He still wanted to talk to you? And he went, look, I know what you've been thinking. See, because a lot of us were introduced to the idea of a God who would go, I know what you've been thinking. I know what you've been doing. I know your innermost secrets, and you better repent because I am just a hair's breadth away from causing some mayhem. And we learned that. That's deep in sort of that deep kind of Calvinistic background way back, say, Jonathan Edwards' 18th century you are a sinner in the hands of an angry God hanging like a spider web over the pits of hell. I and mean, that was in his sermon, you know. And, and we, a lot of us kind of had that, that core uh, somewhere in, in, in our experience. But what if it is that he knows you, because he does, and he still wants to talk to you? And he goes, I know your stuff. That's okay. Come, come on in. Secret place. You and me. Let's talk this out. We got some stuff to work on. We got some stuff to wrestle with. Knows your stuff, still wants to talk to you. So I ask you this. Do we need to up our game in order to approach him? Do your kids need to in order to approach you? The second question does answer the first one. The first one, do I need to up my game to approach God? Do I need to clean this thing up, read a little more, dress a little better? You know, I am going to the Lord's house. Maybe I should style it up a little bit, show him how serious I am. I'm not against you styling it up when you go to the Lord's house. You can style it up, style it up. If you want to, it doesn't, it doesn't make me any difference. I, in fact, I've seen that pendulum swing both ways to where it's kind of sickening. I've watched people in churches who would meet you at the door with a tie. They had spare ties in the closet of the foyer so that visitors all had a tie because you, you couldn't come in here without one. Um, I've been in grace communities that would laugh you out of the building if you walked in in a suit. Like that was somehow more liberating because you should be, you should be free in this place. This is a sandals and shorts and tank top place. You should be free of that suit and tie. And you go, well, maybe the guy just wants to wear a suit and tie. I mean, I don't know, maybe he's on his way to a funeral. Maybe he just likes his tie. I, what do you care? The, the truth is, is that I can't imagine that my kids would feel as if they had to dress a certain way to come and see me because we're family and so therefore they don't need to spiff it up to come to me. Neither would you need to to come to God. This kind of hit me this week because I actually saw a, 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 a tweet from a, I don't know, pretty influential pastor who was going off on how you dress he was sick of it. He was sick of the way that people are sloppy dressed in church. And so he came up with a clever one about if you were to go see the president of the United States, you would dress your best because you honor him, his house, and his position. So what does that say about what you think of God that you don't treat God the same way? And my thought was, I bet the president's kids get to wear whatever they want when they go see the president. So you need to ask yourself if you're just a servant citizen in the kingdom or you're one of dad's kids 
and then treat dad accordingly. And don't feel like you got to spiff up to go see him. One of the things that had to be attractive to the disciples about Jesus was how easy it was for Jesus to talk to his father. That Jesus didn't make a presentation of it. You know, oh, wait a minute. Before we decide if we're going to heal or not, I need to go off and talk to dad. And then I'll come back and I'll tell you what dad says. We don't ever see Jesus stopping in the middle of life to run away and pray about it. I'm not cutting down praying about it. Please pray about it. But this attitude with which he was constantly in communication with his father was quite spectacular. So do we need to up our game? No. In fact, let me land in two New Testament passages, try to show you that the New Testament believes in meditation as well. They just might filter it through a little bit different lens. One of them is 1 Timothy 4, where Paul says this, let no one despise your youth. This is a great, this is Paul writing to a young pastor. And Paul says, don't let anybody despise you because you're young. Be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Don't ask too much, Paul, right? Yeah. Good luck, Timothy. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. By the way, don't ever let anyone tell you that doctrine's not worth wrestling with. Because, my goodness, of course it's worth wrestling with. It's... Part, it's the basis of the things you believe and why you believe them. And don't neglect the gift that's in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. 15. Meditate on these things. The word there for meditate is a, it's pretty interesting. It's actually really close to a, the modern word, use your imagination. Which I thought was pretty cool. Not a phrase that pops up all the time in the New Testament. Paul's really encouraging Timothy to use his imagination. How do you do the... Go back a screen real quick, Brian. Read, exhort, doctrine. Don't neglect the gift. Go back another one. Be an example in word, conduct, love, spirit, faith, purity. How do you do all that stuff? Go ahead to 15. Use your imagination. Bring you to the table so that the you that is the, the believer meets who he is in you. That's look in to look up. Bring it to him. Work together with him. I think it speaks to why Jesus said in Matthew, watch me, work with me. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Work with me. Part of meditation and prayer is working with him. Listening to what he says, a little give and take. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely over to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue doing this. You'll save yourself and you'll save those that hear you. Sounds to me like meditation is a pretty big deal. It's so big you'll save yourself a lot of pain and you might even save someone nearby. Don't think in terms of save from hell. Save from whatever they need saved from because you wrestled in that private closet you meditated on these things. Here's the most famous one I think Paul ever wrote. Philippians 4, 8, 9. Finally, brethren. Finally is a good way to stop a Bible study. It says we're finally there. Finally, brethren. Whatever things are true. Whatever things are noble. Just. Pure. Lovely. Good report. If it's virtuous. And if it's praiseworthy. Meditate on these things. Old King James says think on these things. Meditate. It's actually the same Greek word that Paul used to the Romans when he said, reckon yourselves dead. Count it. Done deal. Paul says here, if it's noble, if it's just, if it's pure, if it's lovely, if it's good, if it's praiseworthy, count it a done deal. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do and the peace of God will be with you. Sounds like meditation and prayer, pretty important part of our walk with God. Pretty essential, not just as a way of making petition known, but as a way of knowing the giver of our petitions. Next week, we start the, the Lord's Prayer. All of that lead in to get you to our Father who art in heaven and the beauty of that prayer. I think it's going to, I think it's going to light a fire under your, say your prayers. 
Um, you know what to pray, but when you don't, say your prayers, because it's good to have some prayers. And the Lord's Prayer is a good place to start. No promises that we can do it in one week. We're going to give it a shot, but I don't really think we'll be able to. So, All right. Let's pray in one accord over this. Father, thank you. Thank you for this volume of stuff in both Testaments that talk to us. And we just scratched the surface about meditation and prayer. The fact that we get to watch Jesus teach prayer in the Sermon on the Mount is quite a treat and an honor. I want to pray what the disciples prayed, which is teach us to pray. And as we learn what not to do and we learn what to do, Father, this glorious adventure of prayer gets better and better as we realize we're in the secret place. With our Father, we're in relationship, which means we can bring anything we want to the table. So help us on this journey to learn exactly what that means and what that looks like. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.